Titanium is a weird metal for many reasons. It's as strong as steel, but it's half the weight. It's the fourth most abundant metal on Earth, but one of the most difficult to purify and process. Titanium is one of the only elements that'll burn in nitrogen, and if it catches fire, it can't be put out with water or CO2. One of the weirdest things about it, though, is that on its own, it doesn't really oxidize. In fact, it's commonly used in piercings and orthopedic surgery for joint replacements because it's impervious to our body chemistry. However, if you get it excited by heating it or running electricity through it, it does this. It turns bright, vibrant, almost unnatural colors. Weirder still, the oxidation that looks blue or green or purple really isn't. It's transparent. But as light passes through it and reflects from the metal's surface, it's slowed down by the oxide, shifting its wavelength and changing its color. And what color it appears depends only on the thickness of the oxide layer. If you sand them off, the oxides return to the light gray of the titanium. As I implied earlier, you can use heat to color the titanium, but it's a bit random and difficult to control. The better method uses electricity and is called anodizing. It's a quick and relatively easy process and the closest thing to a magic trick that I know. The term anodizing refers to the rather harebrained idea of using a liquid electrolyte to complete an electrical circuit with your piece acting as the anode carrying the positive charge and a piece of stainless steel acting as the cathode and carrying the negative charge. You use a rectifier to change the alternating current to direct current, which is safer and smoother, and to adjust the electricity's voltage and current, or amperage. Wear safety glasses and rubber gloves, and always plug your power source into a GFCI-equipped outlet to avoid getting electrocuted. Having said that, the rectifier, outlet, and circuit the outlet is attached to all have circuit breakers built into them. So while there's a risk of shock that's unavoidable as part of this process and needs to be respected, if you wear rubber gloves to insulate your hands and keep them out of the electrolyte when it's charged, it's not difficult to avoid shocking yourself. If you do still manage it, it'll be a brief, uncomfortable lesson, not a fatal one. The anodic oxide layer is very tough but thin, so before you begin, all other mechanical processes such as filing, sanding, bending, or any other thing that might scuff up or damage the surface should already be finished. Also, the colors are formed by light reflecting off the metal's surface, so the more reflective the finish, the cleaner and brighter your colors will appear. 30 minutes before you're ready to anodize, turn on the coffee warmer to heat up the multi-etch. Plug the black lead into the negative port on the front of the rectifier and attach the alligator clip to the tab of the stainless steel cathode. The clip should not touch the electrolyte solution as it ruins the clip and distorts the electrical settings. Plug the red lead into the positive port on the front of the rectifier. Put on rubber gloves and degrease your metal thoroughly with soap and water until the water sheets off the surface rather than breaking. Using rubber-coated tongs, dip your titanium in the hot multi-etch for 5 to 15 seconds. This cleans the surface and gives you a brighter colors. As you can imagine, it takes a pretty harsh chemical to affect titanium, so the multi-etch is nothing you want to get on your skin, and you don't want to inhale the fumes it gives off when it's hot. Always wear rubber gloves when using multi-etch, and use it in a well-ventilated space like our chemical room. The electrolyte, on the other hand, just has to be something with some sodium content. We use trisodium phosphate, which is a detergent used to wash walls before painting, but I've heard of people using salt water and even Diet Coke. Attach the red lead to your workpiece. We use a mini grabber available from Reactive Metals that has a niobium tip that can safely go into the electrolyte solution. Just don't put it in past where it swells out into the handle end. If you're using a lead with an alligator clip instead, do not allow it to touch the electrolyte. It throws off the voltages. Instead, attach a thin titanium wire to your piece and attach the clip to the wire. Turn the current knob all the way up until it stops and turn the voltage knob all the way down 
This tells the machine to automatically adjust the amperage depending on the voltage settings. We have a color chart made of 1 cm squares anodized in 5 volt increments. The colors depend on the thickness of the oxide, which is determined by the voltage. They always appear in the same sequence, which is not Roy G. Biv, by the way. So a chip chart allows you to approximate what voltage will give you the color that you want. The voltages on the samples, though, are only approximate. If your metal has more mass or less mass than the sample, the voltage may be slightly different. Also, the texture and preparation of your metal may be different from the sample, and that will also affect the outcome. On the flip side, the thickness of the oxide is determined by the voltage, and weirdly, is not cumulative. So if you shock your metal to 30, and then to 50, you get the color at 50, not 80. Or if you only shock half the piece to 30, and then shock the whole piece to 30, the whole thing will be very close to 30, not 30 at one end and 60 at the other. This matters because the process is one way. If you overshoot your color, it's difficult to correct it. You can't simply turn the voltage back down and tune the color like a radio. But you can always turn the voltage up. My suggestion is to always set the voltage to 10 volts under the desired color and creep your way up a few volts at a time. There's a button on the front of the rectifier labeled standby, which cuts the power to the lead wires until you're ready and keeps you from getting shocked. When you press it once, it stays in and cuts the power. If you press it again, it pops back out and allows the power to flow. Make sure the button is in and the machine is in the standby mode. Attach your metal to the red mini grabber. Turn on the rectifier and adjust the voltage to 5 to 10 volts less than the desired color. If your machine's in standby mode, or if your metal's out of the electrolyte, you'll have to hold the preview button down to see the numbers changing. Using the handle of the mini grabber, submerge your workpiece beneath the surface of the liquid. Be careful not to touch your metal to the stainless steel cathode. It'll create a short circuit and trip the breaker. Press the standby button to allow the electricity to flow through the leads. Your metal will fizz and almost immediately change colors. Give it a few seconds to stabilize, and then press the standby button again to cut the power to the leads. Withdraw the metal from the electrolyte, rinse it, and dry it. It's important to dry your piece before checking your color. Since the oxide layer is transparent and affects the color depending on its thickness, any additional thickness from water or finger grease will affect the appearance of the color. Take your piece off the mini grabber, and then check your color by comparing it to the chip chart. The colors always appear in the same order, so if your piece matches a chip for a lower voltage than the desired color, turn up the voltage slightly and shock it again, and repeat this as necessary until you get the color you want. If you overshoot your color, consider embracing life's unexpected gifts and enjoy the random new color. Failing that, you can stick the piece back in the hot multi-etch for 20 minutes or more to break up the anodic film and sand it back to bare metal and start all over again. The process as I've shown it here is for changing the whole piece to the same color, but there are a lot of other things you can do. Strangely enough, if the electrolyte can't get to the surface of the metal, the oxide can't form. So if a part of your piece is held out of the electrolyte, it won't anodize. So you can keep that end bare, or color it at a different voltage. Or you can color the whole thing to a low voltage, then pull it part way out and color it again to a higher voltage. Or you can use masks or resists to keep the electrolyte from getting to the surface. So you could put a mask on the bare metal and color it to a high voltage color. Peel off the mask and recolor it to a lower voltage color. The high voltage color won't be affected by the additional lower voltage.
or well, you could color the whole piece to a low color, put waterproof tape over part of it, and color it to a higher voltage, and the color under the tape will remain unchanged. Or the oxide layer is tough, but thin, so another possibility is to color your metal, then scratch or sand through the oxide to the bare metal, and color it again at a lower number. Or, if you like rainbow stripes, you can color your whole piece of metal at 5 volts and slowly raise the piece out of the electrolyte as you quickly turn up the voltage.